in there. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming, everybody. Um, so we're going to start in a minute with a um, this, uh, presentation from Jean. Um, this is a presentation that um, uh, Jean and I have worked on together, to be clear. And um, there are a, a couple of bits in there that I've asked to be in there. And there's a particular bit of terminology in here as well, um, living repo, which is a terminology that I've coined that we can, um, it, that will be explained, but we can choose different terminology afterwards. And then at the end of it is the um, question slide that I would like to, uh, I'll then go back to after Gene's bit, just to talk through very briefly and then ask then to move forward on that. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Lars is busy. So um, he can't come and explain the things that he was, um, he's was he been thinking about this, but um, that's the plan. Has anybody got anything that they would like to say or discuss before we get on with this? Um, yes, I'm sharing a link to the hedge doc in the, the chat room. Uh, it's also linked to uh, on the, the wiki and um, I'll be loading the slides momentarily. Give me one minute. Gene, what chat should we be looking at? Uh, so, um, actually, that's a good point. I put it in um, the RPC chat. However, I believe there's also in Zulip a um, another channel. Let me let me double check this. Well, uh, the channel in Zulip will be RPC then. Yes. Should be, yeah. So that'll be the same one. So RPC, Zulip channel. Okay, are the slides still loading? Yep. They, oh, no. We're ready to go with the slides. Great. All right. So thank you, everyone, for attending uh, to discuss uh, how we can use GitHub in uh, Auth48. So uh, here is the note well slide uh, as a uh, side meeting of the IETF. Um, we also need to note well, and um, I'm sure at this point everyone has seen this. Yeah. So uh, our agenda uh, is uh, basically to very briefly go through the uh, experiments since IETF 114. Um, talk about the goal, um, discuss uh, what we want, and we being different parties, uh, the LLC, the RPC, the authors, and um, just start brainstorming about how we can uh, make this better. Any agenda bashes? All right. Okay, so since IETF 114 last summer, uh, we've had uh, four experiments. Um, three were in GitHub, one, one was not. Um, the agreed uh, experiment parameters um, from 114 were uh, that the RPC forks the repo, does um, the work in the fork. Uh, originally, uh, we had limited the experiments to, we're just going to use um, work in XML. Um, although for all of these, they ended up being a markdown. And um, another uh, limit was uh, we wanted to work with very short docs. However, uh, one of them was very long. And the details of these experiments can be found at uh, this link here, which is to uh, RPC Wiki. And um, if uh, we've heard from the authors, uh, we received their feedback uh, and they've given us permission to share that feedback. Uh, it's also captured on those pages that you can get to following that top link there. Um, does anybody have any um, I guess general questions about the the experiments. I, I wanted to spend I want to spend more time uh, focusing on um, 
going forward rather than um, talking about the these. But yeah, I'd, Richard, I'd, so. Okay, sorry, after this one, I'd rather not take any questions on these experiments. I'd rather go on to the things that have been learned so that we don't end up just talking about stuff that's coming up. But Richard, yeah, uh, yeah, I just wanted a quick uh, background question. Um, to just to go one step back in history and ask how the, the process that was followed in these experiments came to be. It was discussed at um, IETF 114. Uh, yeah. We had another GitHub workshop like this. Mm -hmm. um, and it was what the, the group came together on. And um, it, it's also captured. So the notes from 114 are also uh, on our wiki. And you can find them following that link. Thank you. All right, our goal is to find a way forward where everyone is happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, OK. So um, what the LLC wants, well, is a happy community. And uh, also wants a cheaper, faster, and better RPC. So um, to, to help with that, you know, a custom and controlled environment to maximize the output of the RPC staff, um, and uh, also minimizing uh, the number of processes and environments that uh, we need to learn and implement. Um, and then, of course, we still want to ensure uh, our high standards are maintained. And what we want to do with our process changes is to make things better. Oh, um, so I'm sorry, I can't see the, the cue from, uh, from there. So I guess I could read from that. So, um, Michael? So as my recollection for 944B, uh, you asked us if we wanted to participate. And after some conversation, including Richard, who I think is in the room, we said no. Is that not, is that, does that, is that any correct, Richard? That is that is correct. Um, okay. Although Richard also wanted to to note that document as as an experiment, so that we would um, collect feedback on it. So that's okay, what we've okay, done. great. Thank you. I just was like, I don't think we did that. That's all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So um, uh, this slide is uh, what we what the RPC thinks the authors want. So we hear the authors want a better process than just uh, email off 48. And we also want a better process. The RPC does. Um, we hear that authors want to use GitHub. Um, we also hear that authors would like to maintain, say, a living repo for their documents. So um, and, and what we think that means is that um, even after the document is published as an RFC, the authors have an expectation that they should be able to like jump in and create a BIS document um, fairly quickly if like issues come in or people spot errata, um, that they would like to maintain their repo so they can um, capture issues in the issue tracker and um, start working on uh, perhaps a BIS draft. Um, although we also hear some authors will just archive their like the repo after their RFC has been published. So um, as I said, this is what we are hearing authors want. Um, it would be good to to capture more of um, what authors what their expectations are for um, the the repos that the the documents are in. Um, after the RFC is published. So, and um, let's see, also changes, um, tracking issues and basis of the BIS document. I, I guess um, I would like to go ahead and ask here, is there um, other reasons? Um, is it just for BIS docs or um, in tracking? Yes. Yeah. 
Do you have a mic here? <laughs> I can have the mic from here. Yes. Um, I would add to that that the repo is useful for being able to look at the history of a document and to have the history essentially truncated prior to Auth 48, um, you wind up with a divergent copy of the document that does not match what's published. Whereas if you reconcile all the changes back in, then the repo <clears throat> will show you for any given change, where was that introduced and why? And so it's, it's useful as a history tool. Could you state your name for Mike Bishop. This is Richard Barnes. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to add a little color speaking as an author um, to the why folks are interested in using GitHub because, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool like any other. Um, why do we find it appealing? I think there's a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, GitHub has is it, it, the workflows it has are built around easy reviewing of changes. Um, and so it has diff tools and uh, diff review tools that facilitate the sort of discussion that happens in Auth48 uh, in terms of identifying changes, accepting changes, rejecting changes, mm -hmm. adapting changes. So that there, there's those uh, good review tools that folks, uh, that the working groups are used to. And I think that's the, the second main point is that the GitHub workflows in many working groups are the tools the working groups are used to using. Uh, and so, Auth 48, right, you know, without a, a GitHub based process is, is sort of a jarring transition. You've been working on this document for years using one tool set, using one workflow, and now you have to transfer to something completely different uh, to get it the last 2% of the way there. Um, and so having continuity in the workflows um, is, you know, really smooths things out and makes the process less jarring for the working group. Um, one one third point to, to highlight that another benefit of, of the GitHub sort of tying into what, what Mike was saying is that um, you know another difference about the non GitHub Auth 48 is that it's, it tends to be very opaque. It's a, it's a transaction between the RPC and the authors, and there's no visibility to the working group at all. Um, and so I think there's some value in the transparency of having things in GitHub and uh, accountable and recorded, so you end up with log not just for historical purposes, but so people can see what's happening in the document. Um, as it's being finalized. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to be following the queue from Meet Echo. So if you want to um, uh, speak again, please, if you could use that. Um, so, Paul, over to you. Um, I'd like people to be careful about saying working groups want and people want, individuals want. Um, some working groups use GitHub extensively. Um, I'm about to. You know, I don't like people speaking for other people, but I'm about to do so. I have co-authors who have said, can you do this for me? I just, and I won't use the word hate, <laughs> GitHub. I am a participant in working groups that use GitHub, and I'm participant in work groups that do not use GitHub because some of the chairs really dislike it. So let's be careful about speaking for others, please. Thank you. Yeah. If I can just respond to that briefly, no, I, I don't didn't mean to claim anything about all all working groups, um, but I do think there is a, a core, uh, you know, at least say eight or ten, a dozen working groups that have a fairly common uh, GitHub workflow pattern. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I agree that the, like the, the RPC has a challenge in accommodating the different workflow styles of different working groups, but I think there there is enough. Uh, commonality to GitHub usage across a, a pretty broad slice of the IETF that it merits consideration and yeah. alignment. If we can stick to the requirements before we get on to the solutioning bit, that would be great. Um, Robert, next please. So I think it would be useful, Richard, to gather um, that core group that you were talking about, just to list the, the working group names. Um, I suspect that there are several clusters of working groups that use different workflows and understanding the dis just how different those different workflows are will feed into what we should do. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. That way? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I would say two things. Um, one, I'm sure there are different workflows, but um, there's, a, there's a broad set of ones that are all using Martin's tools. And those all have a similar workflow and post them on Martin's tools. Um, so I think, you know, Martin, perhaps you could, you could click, click to see which working groups actually do that. Um, 
but like you know, to a, a starting a starting list for a starting list for like what um you know places that like are using a common GitHub workflow is MLS, TLS, Quick, HTTP, um, Acme, um, uh, you know, um, you know, bas basically the the the, the uh, um, uh, I think RTC Web um is, is a little more uh, is a little more older, but it's similar to the workflow. Um, uh, uh, MLS, um, I think that's almost right. So that'd be as a, as a, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, there's a common cohort of those people. Um, mm -hmm. The um, uh, to, to this list, oh, I, I can now only see a, 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 a barcode, but to this list of requirements, I think um, the um, uh, not quite reflected in here is a desire to see this, be able to see the exact state of the document at any given time and exactly what changes have been made. So like, you know, when, when I get an email that says, you know, um, please review, like this, please review this thing. That's on, that, that's like a link that was is, has different context than the link the same link two weeks ago. That is very hard for me to work with. Whereas in GitHub, I can exactly tell, you know, exactly what happened between point A and point B and who made those changes. So like accountability for and tracking and, 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 and discovery of every single change in the document is like is actually very important. It's also very important, by the way, when substantial changes are made in GitHub it's in off forty eight, so that when you like come back to it, which I mean like increasingly happens. Um, and when you and when you come back to it, you know, two years later, and you're like, you know, wh wh why do we do this? I want to be able to go and look and be like, this is why this change is made. Here's a note for this change, and that's true for everything you do all of the working process. And so, and so it's, it's very important to be true for anything you do after working process. Great, Jean. Is it possible to put the presentation back? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, did, did no, you... it didn't go to sleep. Sorry, did you want to jump in then before I go on to the next person? Um, I'm trying to bring the slide back. And um, so that was an interesting point about authors wanting to look back at decisions made in Auth48, um, but not just the, um, you know, the change between the ID to RFC, but perhaps from when the RPC is done with their edits to our, the that step when it's published. So, okay. I don't, I don't um, mean just authors, by the way, I mean working groups. I and mean, what I mean is when I go and I want to do a BIS and I'm like, this doesn't look right. And then I'm like, why did we do this? And I want to go back and find out why we did it. And, um, you know, in a 500 page, 200 page document, it's like not practical to remember it all. So like, it's, I mean, you can say the authors, but it's like, it's, it's, the, it's the working group and the editor group and the next group. Okay, so now I'm trying to figure out the uh, technical issue of displaying Jean, the slides. Okay, Jean, I'm going to go on to the next person unless you... Okay, yeah. go ahead and I will um, right. work on this. Great, thanks. Carsten, on to you. Yeah, I think what, uh, I don't know who uh, said a couple of minutes ago really is, is important. Um, so we don't all have exactly the same requirements on those last 2% of the process. The, the requirement that we actually have is continuity. And all other requirements pale against that. So the, the RPC, of course, also has requirements. But on, on the authoring side, what we really want is continuity. And so uh, Jay's sentence, let's do the requirements before we do the solution is exactly wrong because the solution is the requirement. Okay, thank you, Carson. That's very helpful. Um, Martin? All right. <clears throat> so some, someone asked about how many people use uh, GitHub for managing, managing drafts. I don't have specific information on working groups. I do have a list of uh, 987 repositories that use the GitHub template um, that I use. I could probably maybe work out what, where all of those were if I went through all of them, but there's quite a lot. So um, that'll give you sort of an idea of the scope of it. And I'm not the only supplier of this sort of tooling. There's a, there's a bunch of bespoke stuff out there as well. And I know that some working groups do that. So um, there's, there's a lot out there. I just want to agree with Carsten. I think that, that continuity tied in with all of the things that, that Eric was talking about is, is really the key. Sorry, thank you. Um, Robert? So yeah, that gets exactly to my question. You know, there, e even with the working groups that are using the, the, the template, 
the process that the groups use while they're using that template, how widely does that vary? I think that matters because Richard's point is that people are used to working in a particular workflow, right? And they want to continue to work in that workflow through the off 48 process, okay? And what I'm sensitive to is if we get into a situation where during off 48, we're going to be asking the RPC to learn 550, 600 different kinds of ways to use well, the repo. Yeah, that, that's, we're, that's solutioning again. So let's, um, mm -hmm. more implications of these things. Let's just make sure we capture what people want. So um, uh, Carson, back to you. Yeah, I think one, one important outcome of this uh, activity here um, needs to be telling the working groups how they should shape the process so the, the RPC transition in the end is less painful. So the, the processes okay. we come up with in, in oh, the work Carson. don't fall from the sky. Um, so Carson, I think- we, Sorry, yes. Carson, sorry to interrupt you, but can we just concentrate on saying what people want to achieve as authors rather than the solutioning bits? Because we've got some more stuff to talk about and it'd be very useful just to make sure that we have the full information of what we're trying to achieve before we get onto the solutioning. Yes, okay. but I just heard a comment that uh, this doesn't work for 600 different processes. Well, that, that, and, and, and I, I and you, you may have heard me shut that comment down as well. Yeah. Honestly, let's, we, we've only done, we're only halfway through what people want on this. So it'd be really useful just to get the bits done. So, okay. Does anybody else in the queue want to talk about this particular bit now about what we're saying um, about what authors want to clarify or add to that list or anything like that? I just wanted to, to push back on the, on the 600 processes point as well, because there are, there are not like the, the, the core, uh, the thing that is important is the one GitHub PR process, right? Like there may be some, uh, some like environmentals around that, but like if something comes in as a PR and can be processed through that, like that's the core. Um, and, and what I'll know is like, even if there is some variation, like the current processes don't align with any of them. So like any alignment would be better than, than where we are right now. Um, I mean, one thing to note here is like part of the reason that these working groups are using GitHub is to make it easy for folks to come into the process. Um, and so, you know, I think we can leverage some of that to, to help bring RPC staff into the process as well. Okay, thank you, Richard. Right, so uh, can we move on then, Jean, to the next, well, this bit yes. and then on to the next bit. Yes, so um, what authors want continued, all edits captured in PRs. Uh, um, and we've also heard PRs categorized by edit type and also um, approve every PR individually. So um, the, the note down here in email all 48, um, it's like all the changes the RPC has made are available to review in a provided div file. Um, and then the, the authors can say, yeah, we approve all those and oh, but here, let, let's tweak this here. Um, so um, the all edits captured in PRs. Um, the RPC like fixes bugs in, in the document. You know, we fix typos um, and we are we're formatting and RFCs consistently, so we have a base set of edits that we make that we consider to be, you know, they're not necessarily negotiable. Gene, Gene, sorry, yes. that, that yes. we're, you're now getting into what the RPC wants. Let's oh, just okay, skip. okay, let's, true. Okay. All right, yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've skipped over. Okay, so, sorry. All right, so yeah, the um, all edits captured in PRs and um, by, by edit type, what I mean by that is what we've heard is that um, authors would want like a PR where like all the typos are fixed. Um, and another PR where we have, um, maybe updated all the, if, if there were any updates to say cross section, um, the, sorry, the references cross refs, right? It, 
you know, we changed section 3.3 to 3.4 because that's actually where the text was that the um, document was pointing to. So, um, and then the every everything is a PR, basically. Okay. So, so, because we're we're almost halfway through, so I'm going to speed us up a bit. So, Martin. Yeah. Just just briefly, this, this is um, I think analogous to the way in which um, people who op operate in these environments uh, for software tend to like to get their pull requests, and and that is they they like a pull request that they can review uh, for a single sort of change or a single targeted section or or something along those lines. And uh, I don't think the request is that it be broken down in, at a very high granularity. The idea is to just make the, the, the change uh, reviewable. Whereas um, some of the things that you, you tend to see in North 48 is that everything is dumped in at once and it, it can be quite hard to process. Whereas if you, <clears throat> if, if you have edits that are specifically cleaning up, clean up white space or doing some reformatting, each one of those separate, it does make it a whole lot easier to process. Great. Okay, Mike, and then that's the last bit on this, and then I want to move on to the next slide, oh. please. Yeah, to add on that, um, I think there are multiple good ways of splitting it up that would meet that goal. Like, you might do a thorough copy edit of an individual section, or you might adjust the usage of a particular term through the whole document. But either way, have it broken down so that a change, one change makes one correction, and then it's easy to see that that didn't break anything. Great. Okay, thank you. Should we move on, please, Jane? Okay. Uh, so what the RPC wants, um, we want consistent processes. Uh, we want consistent structures, uh, would want the, the repos to, to behave consistently. And I think in terms of like the next 10,000 RFCs, um, if things are ad hoc, um, that becomes difficult to, to maintain, to, to move quickly and efficiently through. Um, so, uh, we would like to specify um, a branch management process for uh, our own internal reviews of our edits um, because we have multiple editors working on the document. Um, and uh, we would also like to use processes like specific labels to identify the, the next um, step or action holder. Um, and it, these concepts were captured. You can follow this link. We have a repo template. Um, so, and the, the general process is captured in the README. Um, and so we do have concerns about shifting processes. Um, the, when, when talking about working in repos, the, um, the, some things could create extra work for us. Uh, during Auth48, it's um, if the repo is um, been active and worked on lots of contributors and um, we're trying to manage an Auth48 process and well, who is this person who's um, come in with their own pull request or commented on an issue or opened their own issues? Um, currently, the Auth48 process is, um, it is focused, it's limited to the authors. We pull in the, the AD if we have any concerns about any technical changes that may have, been, may have happened if, if wording changes. So the current process is um, very, we do limit the, the participants to the process. And current, um, generally, GitHub is open. Um, so, uh, another concern we have is the, um, we're saying here, the atomization of PRs, like there are so many open um, that for waiting for the authors to approve, um, it, because we were hearing they want, that authors want things in, in, in small pieces um, over large documents. 
that gets hard to manage. The um, and uh, another thing, the uh, the multi-author approvals for each PR. So currently, the way the process is, and we do say this in the uh, initiating email, is that um, first author to speak up on our questions. Um, we incorporate their feedback, and if co-authors have any concerns or wanted to make additions or changes, then they would speak up. And to go with a, a PR process where every, every author, everyone approves, um, and that's just slightly different. And it does slow down a bit because we do see with the email process that you will have one author take lead, you know, provide all the feedback, and then the other authors just kind of sign off at the end with, yep, looks great to me, and, and we're done. Um, and also the um, just blocking of what I've said, the, the bug fixes. It's like, we, we want to make those changes and get those changes into the document, but if it's in a PR that's blocked for other reasons, that's, that's frustrating. So those are some of our concerns. Okay. Uh, let's, well, let's just do this last one about the audit trail. I think we can probably take this one as read. Let's give each person just a quick chance to read and understand this one. Um, and then let's go on to the questions because we, we're going to need a, you know, I was hoping we'd have half an hour for discussing potential solutioning. So if you're okay with that, yeah? Yes, yes. Right. All right. Um, so uh, is, is there another one after this, more of the RPC wants or not? Um, these are, I, I've already the covered trials. these. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yep. Okay. So yep. here's our summary of um, what we think everyone wants. Right. Okay, I think that uh, we skipped those last two slides, but I don't think there's anything particularly complicated in there. Hopefully, uh, we've got all got that. Right? Actually, I did want to comment on the last slide. On the last slide, yep. About uh, non author contributions. Oh. Lovely. Just, okay, well, just we, well Richard, to... you're first in the queue, so carry on. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I just wanted to contribute a, a little anecdote here uh, where that goes a bit against avoid, avoiding this totally and can highlight the value of, of more transparency. So when we were doing the MLS Auth48 big document, um, lots of kind of throughgoing changes uh, in Auth48. Um, and there was one instance where I think it was using the superscript tag instead of uh, you know, a caret. Um, RPC suggested the throughgoing change. I implemented it uh, as an author throughout. And um, several instances, incorrect applications of it were found by uh, a working group participant who just reviewed the PR of his own accord um, and saved those errors from slipping into the document. So I think it's there can be value to having a few more eyes on the process um, and that, that weighs against the risk of, of more churn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, who's next in the queue? Uh, Paul? Yeah. Um, so two things. One, the reason I put my hand up was um, I've been on a document in the last few years where the AD, and this was using the traditional thing, the AD threw something in, in email, that we didn't notice that screwed the document. Fortunately, during the very last look at, one of the co-authors who hadn't been participating at all did a diff and said, that's wrong, and then we realized it was wrong and then reversed it. Um, so when you're talking about authors, oh, oh, and sometimes the AD, that sometimes the AD is super important. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be making a list of who can and can't touch it, that's a reasonable thing. Going to Richard's uh, comment, I think that it is good to have transparency, and I would like it even in the email ones of what we authors are changing, because sometimes there is, some, you know, the RPC finds something that is badly worded. We look at the new wording, we go, okay, that's whatever, but we actually have, have improved the document in a technical way. The working group doesn't see that. I wouldn't mind it seeing it more. But, and this is where I'll disagree with Richard, I would want that to be funneled to an author to deal with in GitHub. No, no. Uh, yeah, no disagreement. I think you'd sort of get that if you have an author approval-based process. Yes. 
Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that it that if we come to something, whatever it is, GitHub or whatever, where there's a lot more people watching, I still would like that to come through authors only, so that not only so that an author has vetted it, but also to make the RPC's life better. Great, thank you, Julian. Um, if you could go back two slides, and Is one more. A... So I, I think um, that slide kind of conflates the technical aspect with the process aspect, because the question whether all authors have to agree to a change or not does not really have to do anything about whether we use GitHub. So we should be careful about um, discussing the changes to the actual process, who has to approve what, and how we do that. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank, thank you, Julian. You. Um, Elliot? Again, so um, you have what authors want, you have what the RPC wants. Uh, we probably need to step through what the streams want um, in this regard. Uh, it, it, we have a, a there, there's a, a column missing, I think. Now, I don't think the independent stream has terribly demanding wants, um, but uh, it's probably worth, uh, you know, stating, okay, well, the one thing I do want is to make sure I have the ability to do the final approvals as I do today. Um, I think uh, the IETF usually forgoes that, um, but I don't know, I, I haven't followed its stream processes in a while. That might have happened in the background without me realizing it. Um, I don't know what the IRTF stream policy is in that case. And uh, there might be other things that are, are useful to track, like what happens if an author, if something's in the RFC editor queue, I know Robert's in the process of making this change where or, or is proposed making this change where we don't um, handle, uh, where, where, where new drafts uh, require manual submission once they've been approved. Well, okay, instead of a new draft at that point, are we talking about a PR perhaps? Um, maybe there may be things that might happen in between, uh, you know, final approval and, um, and editing or final approval by the, you know, by a working group of the ISG in editing, for example, or in my case, uh, you know, I've, I've approved the 5742 response and I've sent it on to, to the RFC editor queue, for instance. So I think we probably need to just step through what the streams need just a bit more as we go through it. And I'm not saying we have to do it all at once. And I, I, I'm very happy for this to be an iterative process. Thank you, Elliot. Martin? Yeah, so um, Jean raised the point that sometimes the, the process that they've experienced um, is a little awkward because of the way that um, it takes a, more time to, to break the pull request down into smaller chunks. And at the same time, uh, one change that's potentially contentious or, or um, under, under question in one of those changes often blocks progression on, on these things. And I think those two things are in direct ten tension with each other. And uh, to some extent, a little bit of discretion is necessary and probably a little bit of experience with, with just running through the process. I think this is one of the things that most new con contributors to, to projects like this tend to experience. Um, a sim simple things like um, an expectation on the part of the authors that, that simple, simple typo fixes and, and commas, it's always commas for me. Um, those things just get merged by the first author to, to go through and check that there's nothing, nothing crazy in there. Those, those easy pull requests uh, can also be easy to, to progress. It's the, it's the substantive changes that require a little more thought. And I, I think my experience with the RPC classically is that a lot of those trickier changes tend to be called out uh, Individual, individually as questions. If those individual questions were indiv individual pull requests, that would make it a lot easier to manage. So you would say, uh, question one, uh, I see this, this text, is, text is a little unclear. Do you think that this 
would, would be a, a better alternative, that text is the pull request and we're done at that point. And, and so the comment of the pull request says, I thought this text was a little unclear, um, here's an alternative. And, and then sometimes those are a bit contentious because as Paul points out, you often discover that the authors really didn't know what they wanted to say and you have to go off and have a bit of a debate about it. But at least then you have detached that particular problem from progress on, on all of the other things. Um, and the other thing is if you do find that there's a large pull request, um, say, say you're redoing all of the references, which is one of the things that I've seen, um, making sure that they're sensible, um, and one of them turns out to be wrong, it's possible to revert a change uh, during the edit of a PR and then pull that out into a separate change to unblock progress, if that's a problem. And I do find that when we're talking about these sort of large systemic changes that go from the top of the document to the bottom and affect a lot of things, uh, those ones tend to be the, the ones that you really do want to get unblocked as quickly as possible because then you have merge conflicts and, and, and no one's happy. Um, and, and so I think there's going to be a little bit of learning on both ends for, for these things, partly because of the nature of the types of edits that we see during Auth48. Um, it, they do tend to hit a lot of parts of the document. So we'll I need, need to work through that. Thanks, Robert. Elliot brought up that it might the having a an, a, an explicit analysis of stream um, desires would, might help. I would suggest that we also um, have a separate list of wants that we look at from the working group participants who are not authors, right, and to understand whether or not. Um, and 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 we might also want to have a do not want, right? An explicit do not want thing. Um, I'm I'm sitting here thinking through the situation that you know some working groups that I've chaired have had um, people that were up really in the rough and unhappy with the way that consensus had formed, unhappy with the consensus in particular and would waste no opportunity to attempt to relitigate anything that you know they were unhappy with and the discussion we're having moves the opportunity for you know bringing up relitigation as comments in a pr and you know that's some, not something that the rpc needs to be dealing with you know how do you how do you get chairs to like shut that down or control it or whatever filter it Okay, um, uh, Lars. Right, so, so Elliot said something about the stream needs and I'm sort of trying to think hard whether my stream, which is the biggest one, has any needs. And, and really the only thing that I can come up with that doesn't overlap with something that's already there is um, that we need an, an RPC process at the end of it that sort of maintains the integrity of the standards process. And what I mean by that is that you know, before and during the ISG, phase, right, during the ITF phase, everything is in the open mail list, there's audit trails, all of that, right? Um, and, and the sort of, I guess, silent agreement was always that once the pen is handed, the pen on the document is handed to the RPC, right? Um, the, the RPC is sort of the, largely the source of improvements to the document and that um, the authors uh, sort of check those off to make sure that the RPC is doing a good job. And the AD's job is to keep an eye on whether any changes that are being discussed stray into changing the established consensus on the document. And by which, by which time, if that happens, they would need to pull it out and pull it back and say, you know, either we need to like rerun the process or, um, you know, have some other way to involve the working group again to reestablish consensus. We typically don't then reestablish ITF consensus, which is a little bit weird, but at least sort of, that's what we try to do here, right? And so that is, I think, what the, the ITF stream at, at least wanted here. Um, and the LLC, I guess, also uh, from a legal risk perspective, would like to have this audit trail probably more so than the RPC, right? Because it, in the end, right, it's not the RPC that's going to get sued, it's the LLC that's going to get sued if somebody suspects that, you know, something happened during the final stages of the publication process. 
Um, so all that said, right, I wonder if, if we can actually sort of try and make some progress, but to see if we agree on some sort of high level principles, like, um, so one, one consequence of this, like the, we always had this transfer of the pen where the authors, you know, handed their document over and the RPC took the pen and the authors then became more like reviewers. That has sort of changed with GitHub, right? Because now it's a much more of a code model where um, especially you have your biz draft in mind and continued work on, on the specification, right? In the past, you would, you know, use whatever document you had and you started a new one. Um, but I, I do see sort of this, this explicit handing over the change control from um, the IETF slash the working group slash the authors to um, the RPC as sort of a, I don't want to say required step, but a, as a pretty clear step that, um, you know, it's changes cannot happen anymore without due diligence being run by sort of a neutral party here. And, and I think that is sort of a, a concept that I, that, I, that I think has value. It, it addresses the legal risks to the LLC. It, it makes it clear that nothing, can, or nothing should really technically change in terms of the consensus anymore. And I wonder if, if you know, this might not be what ends up being the principle that we agree on, but I wonder if we can write down a bunch of things like that, that we kind of sort of all think those are sort of fundamental and maybe we can agree on and then maybe we get something from there. Great, thank you. So I've temporarily locked the queue because I want to um, just re pause and go through something at the end of this queue. We've got 15 minutes left. So if we could um, try to um, make sure we've got a bit more time at the end of this to carry on. So Richard? Yeah, I'll, I'll be real brief. I just want to push back real briefly on this idea that we need to do some big survey of what all the streams want. Like the idea here is not to have, you know, some giant uniform process that covers everything. Like the question here is, do we have a sufficient critical mass of working groups using a common process that it's worth adapting some RPC process to, to fit into that. And, and so like, it's, if, you know, if there's some adjacent stuff that we could cover, great. But, you know, if the IAB wants some completely different thing, like it's not substantive to this discussion. We, if we have a critical mass to do uh, th some other thing. Great, thank you, Richard, Eric. Yeah, um, <clears throat> sort of a couple times is there typo fixes, um, sort of mandatory typo fixes have been mentioned, um, I guess. Um, I, I don't disagree that these need to be repaired, but um, I don't think they, but I think it's actually quite important that they be reviewed um, in detail because not, not infrequently one discovers that like the problem was the text was unclear and the type of text did, um, resolved that unclarity in, the, in a way that was actually incorrect um, and, um, or, or, or applied some other error that was in the original text. And so I think it actually is like very important that they be called out individually, but as Martin says, hopefully they can be resolved quite quickly. So I just like, you know, um, I think that the, 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 the nature of the process is that like every single change needs to be reviewed individually by the authors. And the question is how we streamline that change changes as fast as possible. Great, thank you. Mike. I just, oh, Mike Bishop, I just wanted to go back to something that you had said that the, uh, the RPC also has multiple editors simultaneously working over the document. And that's the same sort of problem that GitHub is trying to address. What tooling do you currently use internally to handle that? So it's not simultaneous. We do multiple passes. So um, we are exploring using GitHub as a way of working, having multiple editors working simultaneously in the doc. So. Great, thanks. Mike, did you wanna carry on? No, thanks, Paul. So I'd like to follow on with, with what Lars said and turn it into a requirement that and I, I think this can be pretty succinct, which is there are times where the input to edits, either suggested edits or accepting edits, um, are limited to certain people. So at the handoff front in the IETF stream from the IETF to the RPC, at that moment, I would say as a solution, literally no one but the RPC are allowed to do pull requests and such like that. If someone desperately has found something or whatever, it can go in as an issue. At some point, then there is a different group of people who can put in, pull, uh, other than the RPC, can put in pull requests or accept pull requests. At some other point, there is one. And then I'm assuming, Lars, you would want at the end that the last person who can do a thing would be 
the stream managers designee which in this case would be the ad so does that sound like a reasonable requirement for whatever process is is brought in so i can quickly jump so i i don't think so so i can imagine a case where it's actually useful um for an author to suggest a pr right we had a case now with with the cubic document where like some the, the, one of the authors said you know we need to change M mss to smss and then um they might as well you know um if, if because and we need to check every single occurrence to make sure that this is actually a correct change right and they might as well have done a pr at that point and then the rpc could have just taken that on rather than doing that work themselves so but i i, I don't see a strong reason for anybody else other than the authors and, and the RPC to sort of originate changes. Okay, and and if, yeah. if something comes up because somebody in the working group also looked at, you know, the, the, the archive, right, that can, that can be escalated through the AD somehow. But in the general case, right, I would assume that it's those parties. And, and the AD, frankly, also shouldn't be the source of changes, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Sorry, so, so, okay, so, so did that be a requirement, not necessarily the actual requirements I gave, but that there is limited at various steps as to who can put something in just for the sanity of the RPC, if nothing else. I mean, for, yeah. for the IETF stream, I would say that, that that is actually probably a requirement because it's not a community discussion phase anymore. Because if, if we turn off 48 into like a, yet another last call type activity, right? Um, we're not really gaining anything. And then we need to moderate that somehow and, and consensus call things. And that seems overkill. So if we enter into the realm where that sort of thing is required, I think that's a pretty strong signal needs to go back into the ITF process somehow. Great, thank you. Uh, Eka, did you want to jump in on this before I say something? Yeah. Yeah, your mic is off. Sorry, it just doesn't happen, right? So I mean, going going back to the two percent point, like the document's been through ninety eight percent of its lifetime life cycle with randos sending a pull request, and it's getting filtered through authors and filtered through chairs. Like people are used to to managing whether stuff goes in the doc or not, and like if we need a little bit of extra sensitivity at the end here, like great, but that's still like within this process of of managing what goes in the doc. Okay, briefly, Lars, if you come back and then I'll. No, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm sort of trying to make up my mind here, right? Because I'm, I'm I, I can see the value in what you're saying, right? I, I sort of worry about cases where then an AD does need to sort of step in because it's not, you know, um, someone needs to decide whether this is like a technical change or, not, or yeah. a, a, a editorial change or whatever you want to call, right? And and that is then creating creates a stronger role for the AD, maybe, but I, I don't really know, right? It's hard to talk about this in the abstract. Yeah, I don't think we disagree on like. Who is in? Who has what authorities? I just think that we don't need technical tools around. Okay, so can we? Can we? I mostly worry about workload right. for the 80s. Right? Okay, can we come back to that? Okay, so I'm gonna um, just go forward a couple of things. First, so that you're all aware, the RPC are having their tool chain completely um, rewritten. So that will then enable direct support of GitHub um, coming through the editing tools in a way that's never happened before. What that looks like, we don't know yet. The second thing is I'm just going to jump straight to a little bit of solutioning. So what I've heard here in terms of people's concerns about learning processes and the, the, the different processes that people want, this is leading me towards an understanding that we need to have a single IETF repo structure, which is used right the way through through working groups and others that also does what the RPC needed to, to do at a certain point and has the RPC tools within it. Because it... No, because yeah. if not, then what we're talking about is having two different repos, one with one set of tools and processes and one with another set of tools and processes and bridging the two together. So I'm going to unlock the queue now so we can go back to this. Yeah. Richard's in it first. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so like, I, think, I think a bunch of people are having negative reaction to your one true IETF process. <laughs> I, I think the assertion here is that there, there, has, there is an emergence 
a fairly consolidated process that covers a whole bunch of the IETF. I think like Martin and I would be happy to document what that looks like and how broadly it's used. Um, yeah, and so I, I think the idea is, is to just kind of have more productive engagement with that sort of process. Um, and I, and that's, that's my, my, personally, my main concern as an author is to like have that engagement be more productive. And, you know, I, it's not really my business, like how the RPC uh, gets. Okay, gets so if, if the RPC has, as I described, a number of people nodding, they have their own repo that have their own processes and things, and we bridge the two so that all of the PRs and stuff goes across so that we maintain the authority and the approvals and things within the RPC one. So the authors are doing that. That's something that you could work with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the way I would probably design it, like other people may have good opinions here as well. It's like the the it, it's it's probably natural for like the RPC to fork the working group repo. Um, and it, well, no, it, no. We're specifically talking not a fork because we're talking their own processes, their own structures. We're talking the content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like the RPC can you know GitHub has this notion that you can take a repo and you know push it. You know, have have another instance of it. Yeah. Um, whether it's a, a fork or there's some te technicalities, but you know you can make put put it in there in the RPC's own context in which they can do whatever labels they like, whatever change control they like, yeah. um, and kind of have a little RPC world uh, to do their process, and that can be a good way to handle multi-editor processes and, and things like that. Um, that uh, honestly don't care about whatever happens in RPC world, like whatever makes you all happy. Correct. Um, then, you know, but if you do that as a fork in a fork uh, or a, you know, a, a copy clone. of the, uh, it's a clone of the fork. Yeah, it's see, see, I, I, it, it, you could do it either way, right? Like there's, there's benefits to both. Ultimately, you'll want a fork to make the PR, okay. right? Um, but if you, if you're doing it, you know, starting from what the working group had, like that'll just make it simpler to, to contribute things back once, once you've got this, uh, okay. things in, in a good state. Is, is there anybody that doesn't agree with this? By the way, the one repo to rule them all, I thought was a stupid idea and I'm glad I <laughs> um, triggered you into this one. So good. So is there anybody who doesn't agree with this and doesn't agree with this as a bare bones potential way forward? There's one wrinkle here that I want to make sure. Sorry, we, the two, the two that we cover. The RPC one. Uh, yep. Go ahead, Lars. So the, the wrinkle is that I think, um, is there an assumption that the RPC would edit the XML? Because if they basically, you know, work on what the working group gives them, in many cases, it will be marked on. And it would be helpful for the, the authors when they review the diffs, if they could basically review it at markdown. Um, and, and I think that is sort of, I don't know if we have to touch that or if it goes too much into the details, but I, I it, it ties into this because a lot of the GitHub drafts are going to be marked on for me. I think that's definitely, I don't think it showed up on what authors want, but like editing in whatever format the document's been edited in is a big point. Okay. Uh, and, and they are going to have to edit the XML at some point. It's not, it's impossible right, not but to, but yes. They need to switch at some point, but the and question they, is whether they switch at, at handoff or at if point, they do yeah. editorial passes in Markdown as long as they can and only when they get to a certain stage, they switch. Yeah, okay, right. We've got two minutes left, so I'm just right. going to check people in the queue if they have anything they need to say. Paul? So... Uh, Given this summary of wants, the working group is done and does a, you know, with their repo and does a handoff. As long as the RPC doesn't nuke their repo at the end of this, I believe all of the wants are met. No, no. Uh, the, the working group doesn't hand off the repo. Sorry. The working group, the working group hands off the work. The RPC puts it in a repo either with fork or a clone or whatever. Yeah. RPC does their stuff. As long as they don't nuke their own at the end, then we get, you know, the history and such like that. So I think that that works. And then when, do, if the work group wants. No, sorry. So just, just to recap what I, what I intended to say, it was like at the handoff, the working, you know, the RPC pulls their, the repo into RPC world. Yep. Whatever happens, happens there. I don't think we care all that much about tracking history in that space. And then once the RPC has done their editing, they contribute it back to the working group repo. And that's the transparency we care about. Okay, so there's more to discuss here because I don't know if they hand it off or if the working group brings it back. Well, but, and yes. just to make clear and one another very, like I think this RPC world repo, like that's the RPC's business and should never be setting okay. off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But no, it's what Paul said. It's whether, it, whether the, the working group pulls it back 
So it's where the where the approvals take place. Right. In that, okay, it still needs to be resolved. Right. Sorry, Mike. Briefly. Here we go. Mike Bishop. So I think there are really three distinct phases here. At least there may be more. Um, the first is when the RPC pulls, takes what's in the repo from the working group and they start doing their edit pass and proposing PRs. And maybe some of that is done completely without the author's involvement like it is today. Maybe we pull, give the authors uh, access to see that repo and start reviewing PRs as things go instead of dumping a bunch of PRs at, when the RPC is done. But there is a phase at which the authors and the ADs have access to that repo to review. And then when the process is complete, that repo can be used to generate a PR back to the original working group repo to preserve all of that in the original document if the working group wants that. And if they don't, you don't have to do that. Um, so I think making a fork, restricting access to that fork so that it's read only to everybody except the people involved in Auth48, and then Okay. Pro um, proposing a PR back at the end Great. once we're, everybody's We're happy. over time, so I think we need to capture okay. that, though. We do need to have a document about this. So, um, uh, Gene, is there anything you'd like to finish off with? But otherwise, I think we're in a position where we have a rough agreement and we need to document it. Gene? No, I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone who uh, came and uh, participated and offered their insights. Yeah, happy to. And I think those of us who've been engaged on this or would be happy to, to dive in and help document stuff. Great. Thank you, everybody. We're all done. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Gene. See you guys. <laughs>